going on, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of Outside the Arena with Mac and Griff. I'm Griffin Senek, joined by my co-host, Mac Rommel, and today we're bringing you a pretty solid episode. We got a lot yep. that we are doing today, a lot of new stuff we're going to be doing and introducing uh, that you're going to keep seeing in the final weeks. But if you're new here before we start, make sure to subscribe, like, and comment on this video. Uh, just, you know, a simple subscribe means you guys are enjoying the content. It's how we know you guys are liking what you're seeing and want to, you know, keeps us going. So please drop a subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. Drop a like, comment what you want to see, comment who you want to see us interview, comment if you want to see us talk about some weird sport that we don't know about. We'll do anything. Just, yeah. just let us know, guys, uh, and we'll be glad to do it. But today we've got a lot on the agenda. Um, so we will get started. Uh, Mac, you ready to go? I know I'm going first with what we're doing, but you ready to, uh, ready to go with this? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's get right into us into this and uh first off we're gonna be starting with an nfl mock draft we're doing the top 15 picks and uh griffin is going to go through his mock draft first right now for you guys yep so if this will load um it's been a little laggy but here we go i don't know why it's taking so long um all right so this is my mock draft as it says 1.0 um we're gonna be looking i'm not even sure when the draft is i think it's in april sometime um april so our goal is gonna be coming Okay, so we're going to come out with between now and then maybe four or five mock drafts. So every two weeks or so, we'll probably introduce a new mock draft, um, see if anything's different based on what we're hearing. But this is our basic first mock draft. Um, pretty exciting. We'll see what happens. So, um, and these are with trades, by the way. So, um, yeah, that will be, um, oh my God, sorry, I'm, I'm on my, <laughs> never mind. All right, first team. I can't. Okay. Here we go. The Jacksonville Jaguars. There we go. Team needs. I, okay. Let me move this up. I don't know if it blocks. I don't know what's going on, but hopefully it's not blocking it too much. Um, I don't know. Hopefully that's good. All right. Team needs for the Jacksonville Jaguars. First one, I got quarterback. I think that's pretty obvious. And then some others, the offensive line, I think could use a bit of a revamp. They're kind of old there. Uh, safety, I think, is a spot where they need help, D tackle and cornerback. So, with the first pick of the NFL draft, I think Max will be similar here. Why is it not Trevor Lawrence? Uh, pretty easy, um, you know, considered a generational type prospect, even though I don't believe he is as good as people are saying. Um, I still think he's gonna go number one to Jacksonville. This thing is really starting to annoy me. Um, all right, whatever. I'm trying to move around this thing, and it's I just like as well as it did with Frank last week, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, Trevor Lawrence. I think it's a pretty easy pick here. Um, I'll move up there. Um, yeah, Jacksonville will take Trevor Lawrence. I've said that seven times now, so we'll move on to the next pick, which is going to be the Houston Texans via the New York Jets. So um, if you can tell by what they need and who they are getting the pick from, I am predicting that Deshaun Watson will get traded to the New York Jets. I believe the Jets have the proper draft capital, get this deal done. I think they will ultimately. There was a report that came out that he would prove trades to the Jets, the Dolphins, and I believe, what was it? Was it the Panthers was the other team? Panthers, yep. Panthers, all right. So those seem to be the top three teams if they do trade to Sean. And, you know, they had the meeting this week with head coach um, David Coley, I believe his name is. Um, if I'm botching that, I'm, I'm sorry. But, yeah, he's, he's going to be gone, I believe. So team needs quarterback. I believe their guard – and uh, work needs some work on the O-line. The D-line as a whole needs a revamp. Safety cornerback, so the secondary needs some help. With the second pick in the NFL draft, I'm saying the Houston Texans are going to go out and grab Zach Wilson. Um, it seemed that he has really taken the, the leap into the number two spot at quarterback over guys like Justin Fields, Trey Lance. And I think that's gonna, what's going to happen here. I think these teams are raving about him as much as I'm not as sold on him for you know multiple reasons. I think he is a very talented prospect, and I think people um, most closely associate him with like a Patrick Mahomes type player, which is why I think people are going to look at him and say, you know, like Mahomes. Mahomes went to Texas Tech, which is a big school, um, but BYU is not not a bad school either for football. But these aren't, you know, these top top teams, these teams that are playing in the college football playoff, playing in these top top bowl games every year. You know, they're just kind of average teams here and there. Texas Tech's better than BYU for sure, but um, I think they see that Mahomes in them, and I think. Um, they're going to get young at quarterback. They're going to get this pick. They're going to have a lot of other picks from the Jets. And I think they'll restart with Zach Wilson at quarterback. The third pick in the draft, Miami Dolphins. 
I got their top team need at wide receiver. Mm -hmm. I truly believe this is the weakest position on their team. You could say the O-line, um, and I think they're really both up there, um, which makes this pick for me between a guy like a Penny Sewell or guys with like a Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddle, even you could say. Ultimately, I'm going to give them Devonta Smith. It was between Devontae's, Devontae Smith and Jamar Chase for me. But I think with that two attack Viola connection, uh, even though he said that he prefers Mac Jones, I think that Devontae Smith is the one, you know, he just won a, the Heisman. I feel like he's got to be the first receiver off the board. And, you know, he's got the established connection with two already. So I think it makes sense. I think that makes sense. And I think the Dolphins will do this. And I think they're also going to sign a guy like a Marvin Jones, maybe in free agency. We're going to get to some wide receiver predictions later. But Marvin Jones is said to be there. I think they're going to add another guy. So it's going to be a, a, a group that looks like a Devontae Parker, Devontae Smith, and someone else. And, you know, that's all of a sudden a very, very good wide receiver group. So Miami Dolphins, Devontae Smith. Fourth pick in the draft, I have the Carolina Panthers trading up from, I believe, the number eight spot, if I'm not mistaken, yep. with the Atlanta eight. Falcons. They need a quarterback. That's what they want um, in this draft. Um, you know, I don't know if they trade Teddy Bridgewater in this trade. I doubt it. Uh, I don't know what they do with Teddy, but quarterback is at the top of their depth chart for me. I just think they're not happy there. And I think it's the, the it just seems like the position they want to address the most. And, you know, some other positions there, guard, cornerback, tight end, offensive tackle. But they're trading up. They're going to pick a quarterback. And that quarterback is going to be Justin Fields from Ohio State. Justin Fields, really last year, people were questioning whether he could potentially go before Trevor Lawrence. Obviously, he had a shaky season. People say he can't read defenses. I don't believe that. I think we've seen in the Clemson game, for example, that he is an elite quarterback, had some struggles this year, obviously against Indiana and that Northwestern game as well. But um, you can make excuses, but I mean, look at that season before and then look at the good games like the one against Clemson. I mean, there's more good than bad for Justin Fields. And I think if you're going at number four, I just think you take him over a guy like a Trey Lance and especially um, I am getting a FaceTime at the moment. <laughs> I apologize for that. We didn't get the alert though, so we didn't get the noise. <laughs> That's good. Um, so represent. Um, give me a sec. Um, yeah, so I got Justin Fields going to them. Um, I think it makes sense. Sorry for that. Um, and yeah, Justin Fields will be going to Carolina via a trade with the Falcons. Fifth pick. Cincy Bengals, um, sorry. Cincy Bengals, O-tackle is their biggest need for me. And, you know, I'm not even going to go through the others. They're going to get the best O-tackle in the class, which is Penny Sewell. Um, they'll be able to get him at five. Going to be a huge addition at O-line. We'll be able to play across uh, Jonah Williams, potentially, if they move him to the right tackle or if they move Penny Sewell to right tackle. I don't know what they'll do there. But uh, he's viewed as a fantastic talent. Could easily go number three to the Dolphins if they make some big moves in free agency at wide receiver. Um, so I don't doubt Penny Sewell, but he will be in the top five. No doubt he will not get past the Cincinnati Bengals in this draft, but without a doubt. Six pick. Uh, I got the Denver Broncos trading up to six via the Philadelphia Eagles. I got a lot of trades here. Um, I don't think they're sold on Drew Locke at quarterback. I think Drew Locke is, you know, um, just not not the quarterback of the future there. I think they need help in the secondary corner, edge as well, O tackle. But they're trading up. They're not going to take a cornerback. They're not going to take an edge. They're going to take Trey Lance out of North Dakota State. And, you know, I think that Trey Lance is a great talent. Obviously, didn't really play much this year. But really beforehand was looked at as the third top quarterback in the class. Obviously, Zach Wilson leaped him. And Mac Jones potentially might even go before him. But Trey Lance, great talent, great runner. Um, he's going to do everything you want. He's got good arm. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with him. Um, to be honest, I don't know as much about these prospects as Mac does. I know he'll probably give some better analysis on these guys than I will, but I don't know. I just think the Broncos not sold on Drew Locke. It just seems like from what the reports that have come out that he's just not, doesn't seem like he's a franchise kind of guy. So I think the Broncos make their move here. I think the Eagles uh, would do better trading back as well. They can get some more draft capital. I don't think that sixth pick uh, you can pick a receiver, but I'm not sure it makes sense rather than trading down to, I believe, nine is where the Broncos were scheduled to pick. So that's what I got in there. Number seven, Detroit Lions. This is a really interesting one for me. Offensive tackle, I think they're going to need a lot of help there. Um, at right tackle specifically, they obviously do have Taylor Decker playing on the left side. 
Wide receiver, uh, a lot of guys being free agents. Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, all scheduled to be free agents. We'll get into Kenny Galladay later. Marvin Jones, I believe, has played his last snap to the Lions. Quarterback is a need. You know, I mean, Jared Goff is there. I, I don't know if they'll, you know, we'll see in a second, but Mac Jones being the best guy on the board. I'm not sure you take him here. That doesn't make too much sense here. But quarterback is a need for the future, I think. Linebacker as well as a whole. And then D-tackle, I think, also. But I got the Detroit Lions. They're going to rebuild. They're in a rebuild. They're going to rebuild on the lines to start. So I'm going to have them taking Rashawn Slater out of Northwestern. I think it's a smart pick for Northwestern here, or for the Lions here. Sure. Rebuild the offensive line first. Um, you know, don't worry about picking a skill position player quite yet. They're still a few years away. You don't have that quarterback of the future likely quite yet. So build on the offensive line. Get a guy like Rashawn Slater, who's a very good talent, and, you know, you'll be set. Uh, for the future at offensive tackle, it seems. So good pick for the lines there. I expect uh, an offensive tackle out of them here. Eighth pick, this one, this is, a, it's gonna, this is a weird one for me. So I got the Falcons via Carolina. This is a weird spot for them because I don't believe they're going to take a quarterback. As you see on team needs, I think they're keeping Matt Ryan. I don't think there's um, a desire for them to move away from Matt Ryan quite yet unless they get the chance to draft potentially a franchise quarterback. Um, to, to play behind Ryan for a few years, which has been discussed uh, potentially. I think they need help at edge and linebacker. I think those are weak spots for them. Halfback is a need for them. Todd Gurley wasn't doing it for me this year, and they don't really have great backup. O-line uh, could use some work. And cornerback, for me, is still a need for this team. This one's weird because they're not going to pick one of these receivers. I could easily see them trading down again, but I, I think they'll make the pick. And I'm going to say they take the top cornerback in the class, and I think they're going to pick Patrick Sertain out of Alabama. It's a weird pick, but I think they're going to have some faith. I think they have faith in A.J. Terrell to get uh, on track and have a strong uh, sophomore season. And I think they're going to build that secondary with Patrick Sertain. I think this team still believes they can win right now. They've got a good offense. They've got pieces in place. You've got Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, Hayden Hurst. Maybe you address running back in the second round of this draft. Maybe, you know, you, you're going to have that. I believe they'll, they still have their second. So a guy like Anaji Harris or Travis Etienne could be on the board there potentially. So, I mean, you land one of those guys, you're in a really good spot. But I think they'll take Patrick Sertain. I think Sertain's such a talent at cornerback. And I think it's going to be hard for them to pass him up. And, you know, they'll get a chance to build a really strong secondary and then be able to focus uh, a lot of their work in free agency. And, uh, I mean, free agency will come before, but. I do think they will focus free agency on potentially some O-line upgrades and um, work on that linebacking core as a whole. A lot of talking. This is a <laughs> lot of talking for one person. So I got, I know, I got the Eagles <laughs> next via Denver picking. Team need wide receivers is a clear number one for this team. They've taken wide receivers in the first and second rounds, but these guys have just not panned out like Jalen Ragers, J.J. Arcega Whiteside. Cornerback's a big need still, even with Darius Slay. Uh, linebacker is another need safety and quarterback I have is number five just because Jalen Hurts we saw a small sample size he could be the quarterback of the future but looking at their team I still believe it's a need for them but with the fifth pick I think Jamar Chase is just too too talented for this team to pass up at number nine you know this is probably the guy they might have picked even at six so they trade back in him at nine and what a talent this guy was he was the top receiver obviously didn't play this year kind of worked out LSU wasn't too great um, but Jamar Chase, fantastic, fantastic talent. Um, you know, without Devonta Smith's crazy, crazy season, this guy would be a surefire number one receiver in the class, but he's not. And he's going to fall to nine here. I think it's a great pickup. The Eagles, they'll have their franchise talent at wide receiver for hopefully many, many years to come. And, you know, while it might not be smart for the rebuild to take a wide receiver, I think it's just, he's just too talented. And I just don't see another pick for me that makes enough sense um, for the Eagles here. Going on to number 10, it's going to be Max I, Dallas I, Cowboys. Um, I got their team needs as cornerback is number one. I think that's their weakest spot. Um, no matter, you know, even with Chidobe, Awuzie, and um, what's it, Trevon Diggs, I just think it's still a problem. They still need to upgrade. D tackle for me, not the strongest spot either. Tight end, I'm not really sold on Blake Jarwin. And edge and safety are, are some more spots to upgrade. I think the Dallas Cowboys, I think the pick here that makes the most sense for them is Caleb Farley, the cornerback out of Virginia Tech. I think it's a good move for them. They kind of, you know, Trevon Diggs was good. Uh, Awuzie is great. But Caleb Farley is just another guy you can throw in that secondary and just be sure. You can move guys around, too. I mean, you could even, you know, move people to safety. I don't know what you could do. Um, 
But I think Caleb Farley, for me, is a pick that makes sense. That secondary was an issue last year, and obviously you can never have too many cornerbacks. So I think this deal makes sense. I think it's one that, you know, you're getting a potential star cornerback for the future and uh, a just chance to get young in that secondary again, which is needed for the Dallas Cowboys. So I like the pick Caleb Farley at 10. Five more picks here. The New York Giants here. For me, I think this team is, is really struggling on the edge um, in terms of their outside linebackers and even that left side of the deal. And I know they got Leonard Williams. He's going to be a free agent. But just in general, I just need some work. Wide receiver, they've got guys, but they're just not stars there. Um, you know, Sterling Shepard is good. Golden Tate's all right. I don't know if Golden – I think Golden Tate's still under contract. But these guys just aren't stars. Darius Slain is not bad, but he's not amazing. Cornerback is, you know, they got Bradbury, but who else there? Um, cornerback, quarterback is for me a need. I, I'm not sold on Daniel Jones. I, I do believe that is a team need for them. They won't address it. They'll keep riding with Daniel Jones, but it's a team need, an offensive tackle. They could use an upgrade, but a guy that a lot of people seem to mock to this team, and it's the guy I'm mocking is Jalen Waddle. It just makes sense. They need that superstar receiver. He's going to help on special teams too. He's going to be able to uh, return punts, return kickoffs for you, which this team needs. Special teams is definitely not the surest the fire thing here. So Jalen Waddle. He'll be the Giants' new superstar receiver. I like this pick for them. And uh, give Danny Jones, Saquon back, Jalen all of this offense. It really could be a solid offense. So give credit to the Giants. Mm -hmm. I have the New England Patriots trading up to number 12. They're going to trade back. Uh, or they're going to trade up with San Francisco. Team need quarterback is number one. They technically don't really have a quarterback. It seems like them and Cam are parting ways. Wide receivers in need for me. Edelman's getting old. Nikhil Harry hasn't panned out quite yet. Um, you got Jacoby Myers and guys like that there. Tight end really is a weak position since Gronk left. Offensive tackle. Um, you've got, I believe, like Marcus Cannon at right tackle. Yeah. I believe he's going to come back next season, um, but still not sold. Left linebacker, I just don't think they really have too many great guys there. But I think they're trading up, and I think they're going to take Mac mm -hmm. Jones out of Alabama. Um, I see that smile. I don't know if you had well, – it would be interesting to hear your mock here. But I do believe the Patriots will go for Mac Jones. And, you know, it's interesting. You know, when you think about it, kind of a similar guy to Tom Brady, a guy that stays in the pocket, not too much of a scrambler. So I think they'll, 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 they'll trade up for him. They're not going to have to trade too, too much because it's only moving up three spots and you're not in the top ten. But you're going to trade up, get Mac Jones. We'll see what Bill Belichick can do with him build around him with some solid, solid weapons. They have a lot of cap space as well, but they'll get that quarterback on the rookie contract and be able to use that money to build around him and build a solid offense and defense. The team always seems to have a good defense. So Mac Jones will be the new franchise quarterback in the New England Patriots. Three more teams here, Los Angeles Chargers. Um, I got their team needs cornerback outside of Casey Hayward. I believe Chris Harris is, is a free agent. Um, I think they need to upgrade there. Offensive tackle is a spot where I could see them upgrading. Guard, another spot linebacker and then tight end uh, Hunter Henry is scheduled to be a free agent if they resign him uh, we'll see but I'm gonna have them taking Kyle Pitts here I think Kyle Pitts is too talented to pass up at the Chargers you've got uh, Justin Herbert obviously your franchise quarterback Keenan Allen your franchise receiver Eckler your top running back and I think they like Hunter Henry but there's a chance he leaves in, in free agency and I, I don't think it'd be even a bad move to draft Kyle Pitts maybe work in a, a two tight end formation they've obviously got a new head coach over there um, is, I believe it's Brandon Staley or no, mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Brandon Staley. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, you know, Brandon Staley came from the Rams, I believe, and they run a lot of multiple tight end sets there. So Kyle Pitts, uh, and even if they sign Hunter Henry, that's a, that's a very good hit and do. And I think for the chargers, it's just the pick that makes the most sense at this point. 14, the Minnesota Vikings, um, big, big need at offensive tackle. They're weak on the O-line. As you can see, I got guard on there too. D tackle, not amazing either. Cornerback could use some work still. And so could the safety position. Um, actually, safety shouldn't even be on there. Safety's pretty good. Harrison Smith, Anthony Harris. Regardless, they're going Christian Darashaw to Virginia Tech. Two Virginia Tech guys in the top 15. That's pretty good for them. Um, just going to build the old line to probably the third best tackle, in my opinion, in this draft class. And he will go play some tackle for the Vikings. 15th pick, it's now the Niners. And there's yeah. one guy in this draft who I have waited to put on the board, and I have it going to the Niners here. You can see the team needs. That is Micah Parsons. I had him dropping go. all the way to 15 um, to the San Francisco 49ers. We've heard there's issues about his character that teams are worried about. He obviously hasn't played this season. 
And I just think he's going to fall in this draft for some reason. I just do believe that teams will pass up on him. I know he's a great talent, but sometimes when teams like a guy better on the board and, you know, there's a guy that makes sense and that doesn't have some question marks, they're going to go with him. And I think for the Niners, this team is built on defense. There's some other guys that make sense here, but for me, you get a chance to get a top, top linebacker that linebacking core outside of Fred Warner isn't the strongest. So you're going to be able to add another star linebacker to that, that defense. And this team is built on defense. It really is. So Micah Parsons, I think, will go to the Niners. And, you know, he's going to have some veterans, good presence uh, from that from some of those defensive leaders there. You got guys like Nick Bosa, who's already a leader, Fred Warner, like we mentioned, um, mm-hmm. Eric Armstead. I mean, the list goes on with those guys. So he'll have guys around him to help him out. But I just think he is going to fall potentially due to some of those character issues we've heard. And ultimately, he will go 15 to the San Francisco 49ers. So that is the Seneca mock draft 1.0 right there. There we go. Mock draft 1.0. And now we're going to get into my first mock draft of the year. And of course, starting oh, off, who else will it be? Jacksonville Jaguars. I said, you said all team needs. You need help up front. You obviously need a quarterback of the future. And really, any team picking at number one, if Trevor Lawrence is there, you have to take him. He's generational. And I know, as you said, you're not high, as high as as high on him as other people are. I'm the same boat as you. I feel like he's good at everything, but there's not really one thing that particularly stands out like some of the great quarterbacks in the NFL have. So Jacksonville Jaguars, you're going to get Trevor Lawrence. You're going to need to build around him, get him some weapons, get him soft, some offensive line help. And you can do that with your later first round pick. But right now, I mean, you can't doubt that it's going to be Trevor Lawrence at number one. Number two, sadly, I wanted to have the Texans <laughs> and, I, and I wanted the Sean Watson trade in here, but I don't know why. I couldn't figure out how to get, get it into here. So Jets at number two, you get your quarterback of the future. And Zach Wilson, as you said, teams love his Patrick Mahomes-esque abilities. And coming out of a small school, kind of like Patrick Mahomes, not really, but uh, he's a guy who can make plays on the run, throw the ball. And really with all these quarterbacks, aside from Trevor Lawrence, they all are kind of runners. They have that athletic ability to make plays outside of the pocket. And I think the Jets are going to want to do that. Of course, Sam Donald, you may want to stay with him, but with a new coaching staff, you've got to get a new guy in here who you want, who you could trust. And I think Zach Wilson will be that guy for the Jets who can make some plays. And the Jets with a lot of uh, cap space, they can go out there and get some help for him in free agency. So, um, Zach Wilson is the pick at number two for the New York Jets. And number three, we have the Miami Dolphins. Last Ooh, year, okay. Miami Dolphins. I like the pick. Off. I like the logo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to get a little interesting with it. But last year, they had off uh, Austin Jackson the first round. They had some offensive line help. They haven't really panned out yet. You hope they could develop. But the Dolphins, they need to protect Tua, and they need to get some help. And as you said, as you had Devonta Smith going at the spot, I was going to lean t- towards that route too. But – with that later first round pick, I think there's more depth at the receiver position to get to a help. Um, and there's less offensive tackle and offensive line help that would be as good at that spot. So Penny Sewell, a guy who's a generational tackle, I believe, could make plays or could help you make plays in the run, could help protect two in the passing game. Great player that the Dolphins are going to be getting. And you could look to add some weapons with that later first round pick. And fourth overall, this seems like a perfect fit for me. It really does. Atlanta Falcons, Justin Fields. I don't know what about it. I just see him fitting in that Falcons offense. And I said, you said you weren't sure how Matt Ryan would do. You think he's a quarterback of the future uh, or for the next few years, but Justin Fields, I think like, I feel that he may be a guy that could come in there, sit behind Matt Ryan for a year or two, then come in and uh, replace Matt Ryan for the future. He has that athletic ability that all teams are looking for uh, right now, as I said earlier. And he'll come in, he'll inherit great weapons if Julio is still around. And Matt Ryan, I'm not sure how long he'll be there because I think he has one of the higher cap hits in the league next year or the year after that. So you could replace him, uh, get rid of him, and and inherit a a young guy who can make plays on the run, make plays downfield, and who really has a toughness that the Atlanta Falcons need. Uh, And as you said, that Clemson game in the playoffs really solidified him as a great player coming out, getting hurt playing through it and playing amazing coming out winning that game and I think that's what really solidified him uh for this spot at the number three quarterback uh or for for the number three quarterback to go in this draft I really don't see how people will want Zach Wilson over him but I guess we'll we'll just agree with what the experts are saying even though we don't believe that (laughs) the field's going to the Atlanta Falcons at four and number five we have the Bengals getting Joe Burrow his former teammate Jamar Chase and as you said 
Uh, they really need some offensive line help. They could have gone for Sean Slater easily here, but I think this is a match made in heaven. I've seen a lot of mock drafts having receivers going to the Bengals and just to help Joe Burrow develop. He has injury last year. I will need some playmakers down the field that will take the focus away from him. Uh, eventually in this draft, you're definitely going to need some offensive line help. Maybe in the second round, you have an earlier second round pick, so you can look for maybe a guy like a Liam Eichenberg there to help out and protect Joe Burrow. But right now, I think you have to take the best player on the board, and I think Jamar Chase is that receiver who will electrify defenses and uh, he's also a generational player I don't think you could pass up on for the Bengals great route running great hands great speed he has everything you need and uh, everything that you want looking for in a receiver and now six pick the Carolina Panthers I had them trade up with the Eagles only two spots but I know that seventh spot would have been rich if they didn't trade up a lot of teams like the Patriots, for example, they could trade up to that seventh spot with the Lions uh, to come and take this quarterback away from the Panthers. The Panthers need their guy of the future, and Trey Lance is a guy that he may need a year to g grow and groom into this uh, Panther system. He's fast, and he's really kind of like a Kyler Murray-esque type of player. In 2019, he had a phenomenal year, 48 total touchdowns, no interceptions. This year, he had his one little game of showing it really didn't mean anything, uh, not having a whole season, not having practice or anything. But uh, that year before, he showed why he was electrifying, and he was actually considered a top two quarterback at one point in this draft but uh these quarterbacks showed out and uh took advantage and got ahead of him uh this season but great great passer great runner and the panthers are going to be get, getting a guy that could come in make plays with hopefully christian mccaffrey if uh, you don't uh, trade him away and um go for Deshaun Watson, you have DJ Moore, you have Robbie Anderson there, you have a bunch of playmakers, and then your defense is coming along. So this is a team uh, that could be very scary in the upcoming years with a quarterback like Trey Lance who can make plays on the outside and does also remind me of Patrick Mahomes. And now for the seventh overall pick, the Lions wide receiver. It's a big need. You have Kenny Galladay, um, who's going to be a free agent. You have a Marvin Jones also um, on pace to be a free agent. They need a weapon, and I think Jalen Waddle is a perfect player to come in there who could take the top off a of defense. A lot of people consider him and are calling him like a little Tyree kill. He has the speed. And we've been talking about all these other players in the past few drafts, the John Rosses, the Henry Ruggs as potential Tyree kills, but they haven't lived up to that. They haven't panned out. And I think we've got so attached to the numbers of 40 yard dash times that uh, we kind of forgot about the route running their hands. And that's where I think Jalen model separates himself. He has the hands, he has the route running to be a great receiver. And I think he is really the, receiver out of the three I just mentioned that will be most likely um, or will most likely be able to reach uh, Tyreek Hill and where he's at with his play right now. So he'll come in there. He'll help Jared Goff. And I think the wide receiver position, if you address that, you could see if Jared Goff will be the quarterback of the future or not. And that will help you with your decisions in upcoming drafts and in the free agencies. Uh, and uh, with the eighth overall pick, I had to put this picture up there. <laughs> Devonta Smith, they need receiver help. Last year, they took Jalen Rager and every year they're taking a taking a wide receiver and they're passing on a great one this year you can't mess it up you have to get the speed demon he's a little slim he'll need to put on some weight but great route runner he gets open he finds zones and that's what the Eagles are missing a guy who could come um, really find zones get open they're having guys who have to make the one-on-one -on -one plays uh, like the um in recent years, the Alshon Jeffries, who were about, who was about to be cut from the team. So this is a guy who will come in there who can not only win the one-on-one -on -one ball but uh, and the contested balls, but he will get open and uh, will blow the top off a of defense with yard after catch and things like that. So Jalen Hurts will be inheriting a great receiver, and uh, hopefully this will help develop Jalen Hurts into the quarterback of the future. You don't want to go out there and spend top money on a quarterback or spend an earlier round, a top first-round pick on a quarterback when you could take a guy in Jalen Hurts for cheap and build a team around him that could be successful I think Devonta Smith would be a perfect uh a perfect player that you can match with Jalen Hurts to lead him to great success and now with the ninth pick I have a trade Chargers trade up to get Rashawn Slater as you said they need offensive line help you had basically the entire offensive line on the team needs <laughs> Justin Herbert he had no protection <laughs> last year and he was putting up historic rookie numbers you're getting a guy like Rashawn Slater who could fill in for injuries play tackle and really what's special about him he could play any position on the offensive line he could lay tackle guard and center whatever you want him to do he could do it and what really solidified him even as an opt-out this year to be one of the best tackles and offensive linemen in this draft is 
he shut down Chase Young in 2019. And I think you shut down Chase Young in his elite season. You have to be a top pick and have to be considered one of the best prospects in this draft. So the Chargers, they're going to help out uh, Justin Herbert with his protection. That will also help out Austin Eckler uh, get back to his form a few years ago where he was considered even closely a top five running back at that point. So I think Rashawn Slater will be a guy who come in, help the development of Justin Herbert and will also help out that run game and Austin Eckler. And now the 10th pick in the draft, my Dallas Cowboys. This seems like the most Cowboys move that will ever happen. I wouldn't expect anything less if this guy is there. Kyle Pitts to the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I mean, Jerry Jones, I, I really want to take a quarterback here, but in in all reality, this is what Jerry Jones will do. He just wants his money. He wants a glamoring pick, and that's what Kyle Pitts is. Uh, no matter what team that get, what team gets him, he, I think he's a top three player in this draft, and he's one of the best tight ends we've seen in the past 10 years, really. He has the catching ability, great route running. He can play outside, line up inside. Uh, he'll need some work as a blocker, uh, but he's a guy you can line up one-on-one, -on -one, a mismatch for any player on the defense, and the Cowboys will be getting a great guy um, to add to that offense and help Dak out if he does stay. But defensively, cornerback, of course, will be a big knee, and I think Patrick Sertain or Caleb Farley would be a great pick here, but I had to go with the Jerry Jones move for this mock draft. I'll change that up a little bit next time, but Kyle Pitts is <laughs> the pick for the Dallas Cowboys. And now – um, Patrick Sertain in the Giants. I think this is a perfect matchup. All the receivers are gone. The tight end is gone. All the offenders you could want are gone. So I really think this is between Quiddy Pay, Greg Rousseau, Patrick Sertain, or Caleb, Caleb Farley, uh, any defenders. But I just feel like a James Bradbury and Patrick Sertain duo in that cornerback position would be electrifying. You're not going to pass on them. And with Devonta Smith going to the Eagles in this mock draft, the Cowboys taking Kyle Pitts, and we know they're electrifying receivers. And also, you can't forget the football team. They also have Terry McLaurin. You're going to have to be able to stop uh, these offenses that are on the rise, and Patrick Sertain will be a great guy to come in there. You're not just guarding the one good receiver right now. You're going to have to guard multiple at a time, and Patrick Sertain will help solidify that secondary with James Bradbury. Uh, you also have Jabril Peppers, so you're going to have a great secondary. Your run defense was great last year. You hope you can sign and re-sign some of your own guys uh, to keep that alive, and uh, this will really solidify their defense, and you really just have to work on the offense for the rest of this draft and in the offseason, but great pick. I think that duel will be dynamic for the Giants. And now – I have this uh, this pick right here, the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, they may be losing Trent Williams. We're not sure, but Christian Darisol is the pick here to help out that offensive line, offensive tackle position. As we all know, they had injuries this year. They were ridiculed by them, and I think Christian Darisol, the set, or uh, I was about to say, I was about to copy you with your own words from the last time, but I forgot I didn't say Caleb Farley yet. So I can't, I can't <laughs> put that up there. A little sneak uh, peek, potentially. a little sneak peek for what's coming up. But Christian Darisol, a guy who could also play at the tackle position, he could play inside at guard, and he has a lot of flexibility as well. And I think that's what's special about some of these offensive linemen that are coming off the top of the first round in this draft. Uh, he'll be able to help out with injuries and even if Trent William does stay, uh, he's aging. And I think uh, Christian Darisol will be a guy you could groom into that left tackle position. Uh, he's a great pass blocker. He could help out in the run. And I think he's a great addition to this 49ers offense that could fill in and uh, groom and grow in this offense. And now with the 13th pick, I gave it away the last time. Now it's the second Virginia type player. Uh, this is from the trade with the Chargers, the Broncos, and they take Caleb Farley. Uh, they lost A.J. Boye. They released him and cornerback is really a glaring need for this team you're hoping you could keep justin simmons so you could you would have a great tandem there uh in the defensive backfield you could also look at pass rush here and even the quarterback as you said so mac jones could be an option here but caleb farley he has the ball skills the physicality uh he's elite and i think that low floor high ceiling uh type of pick and type of player that he is is something that the broncos would like to take a risk on this guy has potential to be a top five cornerback in the league but he also has the floor of something uh, that could be a second or third cornerback on your team. You're going to have to see how he pans out, how to polish his technique. But the Broncos, if you hit on this, and we all know the elite defenses that they have had, I think this is a perfect fit and a perfect team that will be able to, de to develop his skills and uh, bring out that high ceiling that everyone is saying about him. And uh, Caleb Farley, perfect fit for the Broncos. And now with the 14th pick, 
I have Quiddy Pay going to the Vikings. They need some help on that defensive line. You had defensive tackle there, and I really think edge rusher is also a need. Edge rusher. Uh, they had Daniel Hunter. They lost Yannick Ngakwe, and um, they're going to need some guys, some younger guys that could come in, make some plays. And although Quiddy Pay is a raw player, he has the tangibles, he has the size, he has everything you look for in an edge rusher that could come in, make plays. He'll get pressure on the quarterback, and once he polishes up his technique I think he is going to be one of the better and uh, best defensive ends in this draft and also you could be looking at a player like Greg Rousseau I think it's a bit too rich for Christian Barmore at this spot but right now I'm pretty sold on edge rusher for the Vikings they're gonna need some help and uh to get some pressure on the quarterback and uh 15 pick I've been waiting for this we both have him at 15 um, but this is Mike Parsons going to the Patriots. He just seems like a perfect player for the Patriots system. They're hybrid. They like these little smaller, faster guys who could be tweeners, play safety. He could play linebacker. He could blitz. He could come off the edge. And this is kind of a player who, uh, if you compare him to last year's draft, Isaiah Simmons comes to mind. He's fast. He has a play. He has the ability to make plays in the run. Uh, he could cover. And he's really a great player. Just, I think, mental processing and how he uh, reads offenses is kind of what, what has had him drop over the past few months. But the Patriots, I mean, this is the perfect fit for him. Bill Belichick knows how to get these players like him who you don't really know how to use at, at times. Uh, take it out of them and make them great defenders. And, yeah, with the 15th pick, Patriots take Michael Parsons. And uh, that will do it for my Mac Rommel's Mock Draft 1.0. Well, there you have it, guys. Um, pretty, uh, the players were almost identical. I had Mac Jones going in my top 15. Mac had um, Quiddy Pay going in his top 15. But pretty interesting to see there. Um, pretty different mock drafts from the both of us. Um, so, yeah, on, um, I don't know what exactly we'll plan it out, but likely on a two week basis or so, we will keep producing mock drafts. And uh, so, yeah, um, look for that in the coming weeks and um, comment below if you guys want. To see more of that if you guys also want to see us do a full 32 teamer um and we can put it up somewhere potentially on a website or something like that um potential sneak peek to some of our future plans but um yeah that does it for the mock draft and our other topic on the nfl today is going to be a little free agency frenzy as we could call it potentially we're going to be doing this week the wide receiver position we've done the quarterback position in the past so each week now We'll probably go through a position group leading up to free agency. I know free agency is coming up quick. It's in, I believe, like 20 days from, from today when we're filming this. 17th, right? 17th Almost. of March. Yep. So we might have to next week um, focus on some of the bigger names. But wide receivers are really top, top group. Um, so we've got a list of six guys, six of the top wide receivers. They're going to set to become free agents. We're going to predict where they are going to wind up. So, Mac, first one I'm going to ask you about. Arguably the best receiver in this class, Allen Robinson. Where do you think he will end up this offseason? So just remember, when I was talking about the draft, I mentioned that free, free agency money that the Jets have. This is where I think Allen Robinson will end up. He does not want to be a bear. We know that. I don't, I don't think anyone would want, would want to be a bear with that quarterback situation right now. And the Jets seems like a perfect fit. You got Robert Sala. He likes guys who can play, be sneaky, and really make plays. And really, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. But he makes plays and bat, he, he'll talk, he'll back it up. And I think that's what Robert Sala likes. He doesn't like guys who will be a liability. This guy's a consistent guy who last year – had 102 catches, 1,250 yards, six touchdowns. And on the Jets with Zach Wilson, a quarterback who will be able to go make plays outside the pockets, outside the pocket, Allen Robinson has the ability to come back and understand and help develop some of these younger quarterbacks. And I think that's what, what will be special for the Jets. You're getting a dog. And uh, if the Jets even keep Sam Donald at this point, I think you're going to have to bring in Allen Robinson to help develop him. Uh, he's going to be a player that will come and help develop some of these younger quarterbacks uh, in the Jets system. I also have him going to the New York Jets. Um, I don't know how similar our picks will end up being. It'll be interesting. We did not uh, converge on or discuss these, but I do believe Allen Robinson will go to the Jets. I think the Jets are going to land one of these six guys that we're going to mention. And I think Al Rob makes the most sense for them. Um, he's really one of the most underrated receivers in the NFL right now. Um, Mac just read off the stats. He's fantastic. And that's with a Mitch Trubisky, Nick Foles situation. When he is the Sean Watson or, you know, like a Zach Wilson, even Sam Darnold throwing the football. I yeah. still think that's an upgrade. And I think the Jets have tons of money to spend. They're going to spend it. They've got a new coach in place. I think part of the reason some of these top guys maybe didn't go to the Jets is because of that head coaching situation. It was kind of a mess 
They had a, the Jamal Adams fiasco last offseason. Now it's a fresh slate. The rebuilds can go forward. They've got great draft capital. They've got fantastic uh, coaching now. They've got good salary cap. So I think this is a, um, a good good move for the Jets. I think it makes sense. I don't really think there's going to be able to be a team that can outbid the Jets for Allen Robinson's services. Allen Robinson's services. So Allen Robinson, New York Jet. I can't wait to get that jersey on my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right with these signs. I think you're going to have to go out and buy one of those. I might have to buy one, yeah. <laughs> you may have to. You may have to. But uh, next up, I'll throw this back to you, and it's Chris Godwin. Uh, the Buccaneers wide receiver, where do you have him going? Do you have him staying with the Buccaneers or do you have him moving elsewhere? I have him staying in Tampa Bay. I think you've heard guys like Bruce Arians at the parade say, you're not going anywhere. And I don't believe he is. Um, whether they have to franchise tag him or whether Mike Evans takes a pay cut to, to give him a longer term deal. I don't think Chris Godwin's leaving. I think he's a key part of that offense. I think this offseason, Antonio Brown, I don't know what the future will hold with him, but he might be leaving. They've obviously, outside of Mike Evans, then really don't have anyone besides Scotty Miller uh, on that receiver group who is talented. So I think you've got to bring back Chris Godwin. You've got to build arguably the top wide receiver duo in the NFL. You've got to bring it back together with Tom Brady. Um, and, you know, Chris Godwin's a key to that offense, whether you, you want to admit it or not. He is very important to have. He's a guy who can make all the plays, um, you know, line up in the slot, line up even outside. He's not that deep threat like Mike Evans, per se. Um, he obviously had some catching issues this season, potential confidence things. But, you know, we've worked through it. He's now a Super Bowl champion. So how much how much confidence can you need? He made that huge catch, I believe. Um, I, believe I, was, I believe it was against Green Bay. Yeah. That one where, um, yeah, the one downfield. Um, you know, that was a big catch. You know, he, I don't think he has any issues. He's a very talented player. We've seen that with Jameis Winston. We saw that with Tom Brady this year. So um, without Antonio Brown, more shares will be available for him. So I think Chris Godden will end up back in Tampa Bay. Yeah, I, I have no doubt about this. And something I've been mentioning to Griffin well before kind of the news came out that uh, some of these players would try and take pay cuts to keep the team uh, the same. I was worried how would they be able to keep some of these players. And right now, I think the Buccaneers will stay and keep Chris Godwin. I believe it will prob probably be with a franchise tag. You saw what he did with Jameis Winston, putting up elite numbers. He made the Pro Bowl in 2019 when he broke out with 86 catches. 1300 yards and nine touchdowns this year in 12 games his numbers kind of dropped but look at the talent he has around him Mike Evans you added uh Gronk you added Leonard Fournette where you're running the ball a lot more than you were the previous season and with Jameis Winston you put up great numbers and with Tom Brady most people expected more with all the talent of course those numbers are going to drop but what's so special about him and you can't deny this as you said is he, he came up big in the playoffs in that Green Bay game. He came up clutch. I think he had around like 110 yards or something like that. He had the big catch, and uh, he really solidified that win there. And that's something that the Buccaneers need and will need in the future when some guys like Gronk leave, Tom Brady leaves. They're going to need that clutch factor in this offense. And Chris Godwin, at a very young age, is able to bring that to this offense. And you even saw that with Jameis Winston. I'm going to keep bringing up this Jameis Winston point. How could he be that elite with that bad of a quarterback? And then you come to Tom Brady. I mean, this is perfect for him. And he's going to be elite for years to come. I, I, I don't even have the words for, to say how good he's going to be. So far, we're two for two on uh, right. same teams. Yeah, next let's one, I don't know where you'll – next one, I don't know where you'll go with this one. Uh, I think there might uh, – never mind. Next one, Juju Smith-Schuster. Um, where do you have Juju ending up? Will he be in Pittsburgh still? He's obviously said he wants to be a Steeler for life. Or is he going to go chase that bag potentially somewhere else? He says he wants to be the Pittsburgh Steeler, but honestly, right now at this point, it doesn't matter what he says. What did the Steelers want? Do they want him? Do they want to get this Corvetting, Corvetting every single game, even when they lose? I, I don't think so. We kept on talking about after the season was over, and even while the season was going on, this toxic, toxic environment in that locker room. You're still going to have a Chase Claypool Corvetting his way uh, <laughs> into some of these games. But I think the, the Pittsburgh Steelers may not want Juju. I don't think that's a guy you want in his locker room. Kind of a childish childish player uh i want leaders not guys who who will come in, going in on like Juju. Leaders. he's a good guy <laughs> <laughs> i mean he, he really isn't a leader i mean he does the things in the community he, he shows his love but i don't i don't think you should be corvetting your way and stuff you've been elite for multiple years you, you get chase clay well, i get that you're a rookie you're just trying to have fun you're learning things but for a guy that's been in the league for multiple years you, you can't be doing that 
and Trevor Lawrence. We'll go back to this. I think he's going to the Jacksonville Jaguars. They have the cap space. You have to pair him with, with Trevor Lawrence. I think that would be a fun duo. You have DJ Chark there. You have James Robinson. You've got some guys there, and you're going to have the draft capital to uh, add some pieces on that offense, as I said. Uh, offensive line, and as you said, also offensive line. So a receiver there to help uh, Trevor Lawrence develop um, would be great. And Juju, uh, hopefully Urban Meyer will uh, knock some sense into you. <laughs> We're three for three for three on these now. Here we go. I also, if this wasn't planned, to the, I swear we did not convert. <laughs> I've got it on my little sheet with some math homework on the side in the top corner. <laughs> Juju Smith Schuster, um, Jacksonville Jaguars have the most cap space in the NFL. They're going to make a lot of moves because they've got draft capital. They've brought in Urban Meyer. Um, they're going to have Trevor Lawrence. People are going to want to play with Trevor Lawrence. And I think they still need that true number one. As much as we can, you know, clown Juju and, and joke about how he's not a leader, he's a good football player at the end of the day. He is. He's not maybe a true, true number one. I don't think he's a top ten receiver per se in this league. But he's a guy who's going to get his going to get paid. I don't think he'll get paid in Pittsburgh. I think Pittsburgh's going to let him walk. Um, and I think Jackson will take a chance on him. Like you just said, good receiver group there with uh, Juju, uh, DJ Chark, Laviska Chenault there. There's some good, good, good talented players right there. Um, and, you know, give Trevor Lawrence at least a guy who's been in the league for a bit, DJ Chark. Um, you know, he's good, but I don't want to consider him a number one. So give him someone who can be at least a number one. Um, give Trevor Lawrence some options, see what he thinks. Um, so, yeah, Jacksonville is a, a spot where I think they're going to pay Juju. I don't see too, too many teams um, looking at him, maybe Washington, but I just don't think that makes sense. Um, I, I think Jacksonville is just a place where Juju would, would do good. I think the culture there would be more embraceive of, of him and his uh, personality too. I also think, I think that team would be, uh, I, I just think it's a better fit than per se an organization like the Steelers who have had this crazy history. Jacksonville doesn't have that history. You know, he can, he can be more of a free spirit down there. I think. Yeah. 100%. He had a uh, mess around that Florida weather. I mean, maybe we'll have some better Corvette Corvette luck there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see. All right. Next one. Uh, we'll see if we can go four for four. I think we might actually on this one. I don't know though. Kenny Galladay, do you think he will stay in Detroit? It doesn't seem like he wants to. He didn't really play too much last year. Or do you think uh, another team, per se, will add the big man, Big G, uh, to their roster? I think he's staying with Detroit, but it's going to be on a franchise. <laughs> We're four for four. I see it in your face. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, unless I, I don't see him going anywhere unless there's a tag and trade kind of thing. And I think a team, maybe the Giants could be in play for that. Uh, they said they would take a second round or something like that for him. But right now, franchise tag, I think, is perfect. Um, and as I said in my mock draft, they have Jalen Waddle going there. That would be a great duel for Jared Goff uh, to help him develop and get back to his uh, form from a few years ago when he led that team to the Super Bowl. He only played in five games last season due to injury, but before that, he came off back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons, and in 2019, he made the Pro Bowl as he led the league in receiving touchdowns. Uh, they need to find a way to keep him here in their future. He's the future of this franchise, and I think he's a guy that everyone considers a face of that franchise right now out of everyone that's on that roster. Uh, the the Lions have to find a way to keep him. And I think if somehow him and Jalen Waddle end up on the same team, that will be a filthy and ferocious offense. Yeah, I got him in the same situation. Um, you know, this is, I think this was maybe the easiest besides Chris Godwin. Um, the Lions are going to tag him. Um, there's been a ton of rumors about that already. So this isn't that hard. Um, I think if he hit free agency, he would not be a Lion. I think he would leave, but he's not going to hit free agency. He's going to be on that tag. He's going to be playing. Maybe he'll work out a long-term deal. Um, we'll see what happens there, but um, Detroit's not going to let him go. They're going to franchise tag him. There'll be a Detroit line next season. Um, yeah, there's not much more I can say other than what you said. We're four for four. The last yeah. two are where it gets interesting. I, I don't think I don't think we'll have these in common. I'd be really shocked. Yeah. Um, which one do you want to start with? Um, pff, this is tough. How about let's uh, start with Will Fuller? How about that? Okay. Do you want me to go first and, and give right, my prediction? Let's hear, it, let's hear it. All right. So I have Will Fuller going to the Indianapolis Colts. Um, <laughs> five for no five. Way. Yes. No way. No. I, think, I think the sixth one may be a little bit different, but it will be crazy if we have the sixth. Oh, my Wow. God. So I <laughs> – That's crazy. I swear we didn't talk about this. All right. Five for five, I guess Indianapolis will pull it. makes sense. Um, they need a true number one there with T.Y. Hilton setting free agency. It's going to be a free agent and leaving uh, a hint for potentially our next 
pick for both of us. Um, they need a number one. He's in the division. Um, I debated between putting him on the Jets here also, and, and if Deshaun gets traded there, which is what I predicted in my mock draft, having him go follow Deshaun. But I think the Colts make sense. Obviously, he's going to miss the first four games, I believe, serving that PED suspension, um, which will be interesting. But there's no doubt he's still very talented, um, made a big mistake. But, you know, Colts, great organization. Frank Reich's a great coach. Be able to get him on track. And, um, you know, he'll headline a receiving group that definitely needs an upgrade. But, you know, they'll still have a guy like Michael Pittman. I believe Paris Campbell still is, is on that team. Um, Zach Pascal like, might be a free agent. Um, so it'll be a good group. I think Will Fuller makes sense for the Colts, though. And uh, wide receiver is definitely a position where the Colts will look to gar- grab a, uh, a superstar this offseason. Yep, of course, you hit the nail on the head with that one. And now in your position where you said most of it already, but I'll <laughs> get on to that last season. Um, well, without DeAndre Hopkins, Will Fuller proved that he could be a number one receiver. He may not be that elite uh, number one receiver. Like you said, Juju, Juju, not a top 10. I don't even know if Will Fuller is a top 15 receiver at this point. But last year, he proved he could be a, a number one receiver on a team. Uh, he was – oh, I was better – say the wrong thing but uh he had a career high in receiving yards and uh receiving touchdowns with eight and uh but i guess the one knock i'd have with him aside from the pd thing is he hasn't played a full 16 games in his entire career i believe like the most games he's played in the season was his rookie year where he played 14 so injury concerns may be an issue here but the colts a relatively healthy team uh, with a young receiving core a great offensive line a uh, great running back group there now a new quarterback in carson wentz i think a great fit for wolf Fuller would be with the Colts. This last one, I I, I don't I think it's really the I, I same, have to a little interesting. But, like, weirdly enough, I feel like it might be because I mean we've eliminated so many teams now. T. Y. Hilton, we hinted at it there. Um, we both, I believe, have him leaving the Colts, um, yep. unless I'm wrong. Mac, where do you have T. Y. Hilton going? I wanted to have a little fun with this, and he seems like a Bill Belichick kind of guy. The Patriots okay. is where I have them. All right, we're five for six at this point. Five for six, yeah. <laughs> Patriots, we, we know they don't have luck drafting receivers. You have to go out there, get a free agent, a veteran specifically, and that is T.Y. Hilton, who used to be a elite number one receiver. And you have a guy like Nikhil Harris, who, who I think is pretty similar to T.Y. Hilton and how he played when he was a bit younger. So I think that connection – connection is what can what is going to draw Bill Belichick uh, towards bringing him, him in he'll be able to help develop and teach Nikhil Harry and uh, some of the other younger receivers they have there uh, the only knock which is a thing I may not see him wanting to go to is who's going to be their quarterback what's that quarter situ- quarterback situation going to be like is it going to be Cam Newton are you going to go out and draft the guy and we're not going to know that really until after the draft is over who their quarterback is going to be so T.Y. Hilton I think that would be one concern uh when he's looking at the Patriots but the Patriots I think this is a guy they have to go forward and uh go get go get and bring to this team I think that's a team that'll be be able to bring out some of his talents which is kind of diminished which have kind of diminished the past few years and Nikhil Harry should start coming along with this addition yeah, so I did not pick the New England Patriots. Um, I went for the Baltimore Ravens here. Ravens need wide receiver help badly. Um, they don't have the top, top of the – I don't know why I keep saying top, top. Um, they don't have the most cap space in the world. I believe they're at like $18 million or so. They've got some free agents too. So I don't see them going and getting one of these top four or five guys per se um, in terms of that's going to cost too much. I think T.Y. Hill is more of a budget option. And, you know, I think he wants to win at this point. I think he wants a championship. So he's going to go to a team, um, which is why I don't think he'll go to New England, um, that, you know, can win now. I don't think New England's positioned necessarily to be a Super Bowl contender. Ravens have proved that they are uh, a legit team. They obviously um, made the divisional round this year. Um, seems like they need more pieces on offense. And I think for Lamar to get that um, veteran presence at wide receiver, to have a guy who goes on the opposite side of Marquise Brown, but just be so helpful for this offense. T.Y. Hillen, to me, is, is kind of the perfect fit, really helps their problems at wide receiver. I still hope, I think this team still needs another guy at wide receiver um, to work into that rotation. Um, but T.Y. Helm is a guy, veteran, um, makes a lot of sense, but going to be able to be a good leader for that team, for that offense. So T.Y. Helm to the Ravens, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yep, 100%. T.Y. Helm to Raven. We're five for six. I kind of got my hopes up for being six for six. So <laughs> now you guys know that was not planned. So uh, I guess <laughs> Well, I think I can tell based on our reaction. That was a pretty authentic yeah. reaction. So. 
that it, it really the was. And if you guys did not, the Will Fuller to the Colts was the one that that shocked me. The others I could yeah. see. The Fuller to the Colts was, was was interesting. Yeah, that one you could really go in a lot of directions. And I'm surprised he didn't have the Jets. Uh, him going to the Jets there, but we had Allen Robinson going to the Jets at first, so uh, I totally understand that. Yeah. So uh, with that, that will cap our NFL. Uh, talk for this week. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll keep doing free agent stuff. Um, and also, on the topic of NFL, we're hoping in uh, early April or so that we will have our biggest guest on yet. No no reveal yet, just in case it doesn't work out. But um, we are on track to have our biggest oh, guest yeah, yet. Biggest one. Best. It could have beat last week's. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can beat last week's. Um, and I, I do believe that we would the channel would grow a pretty decent bit um, off this interview. So we've been saying it. We teased it earlier uh, at the beginning of the new year. Um, didn't work out then, but we got it. Uh, it's looking like it is trending towards happening. So stay tuned for that. But we're going to talk some baseball today. Baseball spring training kicking off. The day this will be released will be the first day of spring training baseball game. So exciting. I'm excited. For baseball season i know mac is not as excited but he's excited too i'm getting into but it i'm getting into it this year so he's getting into be it. ready be ready for this knowledge it's going from here to up here so we're going to do um each week up until spring training we might at the end of spring training do uh two teams uh or two divisions a week but we're going to predict uh each division in the mlb but first before we get to our division for the day Big news in MLB this past week, Fernando Tatis Jr., the superstar shortstop for the San Diego Padres, inked a 14-year, $340 million deal uh, extension with the Padres. He's going to be there through his age 35 season now. Uh, Tatis has been great in his, you know, two years in the big leagues. He's only had 629 at-bats, or, or 629 plate appearances, sorry. Um, and he's played great, 39 homers, 98, uh, runs batted in, 301 average in those uh, 629 Play appearance. So Tatis, generational talent, very good. Third richest deal in baseball history. So that's crazy to think about. Mac, I'm going to toss this one to you. What are your thoughts on the extension? And, um, you know, we'll get to the impact they'll have on potential next year's free agent class. But just first, you know, basic thoughts on the deal and, uh, you know, what it means for the Padres. And, and, you know, are you sold? Do you think it's worth the money? What do you think? I mean, for a young guy, 22 years old, as you said, uh, the super long extension until his age 35 uh, season. I believe this is the longest extension uh, in history, if I'm right. I'm not sure. Most, I, believe, right yeah, I don't think that. Uh, I believe Stanton's was 13 years. So I believe so. Yeah. All right. So great extension, I think, for the Padres. This was big. Uh, this is kind of what we've been talking about through all sports. You need that guy who's a leader and makes differences. And for a guy that's only 22 years old and is able to bring new life to this team at such a young age, a guy that even the older guys look up to and respect or right now look down to uh, <laughs> in regards to their age, uh, he brings life to this team. He helped end a 13-year playoff drought in 2020 and win a wild card series against the Cardinals. And really, he this kid is special. Aside from all of his play, you listed the stats. He's a great defender as well. Um, he has the effort, he has the passion, he has the love for the game. And I think he came out actually and said a quote about that. This contract isn't going to change him at all. He's still going to play with that same passion, if not even more uh, after this uh, contract. And for the Padres, um, you're getting a guy who will help develop your team and help lead your team to a great future. And as I said, he made an end of that playoff drought last season. He won the wild card game, uh, the wild card series. Um, right. That's what really transformed this Padres team and, Aside from that, uh, this guy's a big play uh, waiting to happen, really. He could take a 3-0 and count, and he won't wait. He'll take that, and he'll hit a home run. That's what, what this guy is doing. A big play waiting to happen, a leader, a guy who knows exactly what to do, and a guy that the Padres will look to build around. He's not just the face of the Padres, but I think he is a future face of the MLB. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they got the extension done. Good for them. Um, you know, there's people talking about, you know, he hasn't proven himself yet. He hasn't had a full big league season yet. That's true. But I think anyone can see that the talent's there. I don't think this guy's just going to fall off a cliff magically. Um, and I think, you know, they just wanted to get a deal done, make sure they had that that security that he is there for the future. Um, I believe he has like a full no trade clause, something big. Um, you know, uh, with Tatis, you know, he's just the generational talent. I think you covered the deal for the Padres pretty well there. So I'll talk now about, you know, the impact it's going to have on the next generation of, of shortstops in the class next year. Obviously, next year you're seeing guys like Francisco Lindor, Javi Baez, Carlos Correa, 
Corey Seager, um, and Trevor Story. Uh, these are all the top shortstops, literally, in baseball. Besides Xander Bogarts, I think you name. Uh, those are the top guys. And they're all becoming free agents this next year. So in terms of money, it's going to be crazy to see what happens. But I think it's going to set the precedent for the top guy, in my opinion, in Lindor. I think he's going to get a similar term deal. Uh, the first few years of this deal, uh, the money is not as much uh, due to, like, arbitration. Um, you know, it's around what he would get in arbitration. And then it picks up, I believe it's like 10 years for 306, 308 million in the final 10 years. That's, I think, what you're looking at with a guy like a Frankie Lindor. I don't think he'll get 10 years. I'm hoping the Mets really do extend him. I really want to get this extension done. But I think with Lindor, you're looking at eight years, around 30 million annual average, potentially. Um, so like eight years, 240. I could see that kind of deal for Lindor. I know people have said it must be 300 million, which scares me. Um, it really does. Eight years, 300 million would be a lot of money. Um, but we'll see what happens. But I think it's going to set the pace that you know a guy like Lindor will probably get around 30 million uh, annual average. And then up from there, I'll trickle down. Story will probably get around that. Correa, maybe a little less. And then Cor um, Corey Seager, you know, he'll be in there. Javi Baez got a lot to prove this year, I think. I think Javi Baez is going to be – I think he'll remain a Cub, honestly. I think they'll keep him. But that's another topic. That's going to be a next year, a long way from now. But I think in terms of setting the market, um, he got what he got deserved. He got what some of these guys next year are going to get paid. So it just sets that market, that $30 million average annual, um, you know, starting at that – uh, four or five year mark on, on Tatis's deal is what it, it will uh, what it will be similar to for these coming years free agents. So interesting to see there, but good move by the Padres. And you gotta love seeing an MLB team. Uh, we've seen some teams. I believe there's one team. It might be the Rockies that hasn't even signed a guy to a major league deal yet. Um, teams being really cheap with the uh, coronavirus stuff going on. We didn't see that in the NBA. We won't see that in the NFL. But in the MLB, teams are just are just tanking, and it's sad to see. But you gotta love seeing the Padres even though they're going to be tough to beat uh, for my New York Mets in terms of um, getting out of the NL. You just got to love seeing it. Um, and, you know, great team, great leadership, great manager. They got, they got it all. They got it all figured out down there. So good move by them. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see um, if the Mets can get a Lindor extension. On. That's what I'm kind of looking at now. So yeah, that's what I got on that. Yep, 100%. And now I think, speaking of those Mets, we got to get into these NL East record predictions. And uh, I don't know if you want to start this one or if uh, you want me to go ahead and start with mine. Um, I, I'm, I'll start. I'm fine starting. Okay. Um, all right. So um, in terms of the NL East, I have, you know, projected win totals, but I don't think that really matters to me. I think the storylines are this. I do believe the New York Mets will win the division. There's partly bias in that, sure. But I do truly believe that they are the better team right now than Atlanta. I think they have less question marks. And, you know, I'll tell you why. Atlanta, great team. They got the Marcelo Zuna uh, re-signing. That was big. They've got the superstars, Acuna, Freeman, Albies, Swanson even. I think you can loop in that group. They're all great. I think there's some question marks with some of those positions, like center field. Do you know what Christian Tosh uh, or Page? I forget how you pronounce it. My bad. Um, you know, you don't know what he's going to give Ender and Ciarte. He's getting old. Uh, third base is a bit of a question mark. Do you play Camargo there? Do you play... Austin Riley, um, Travis Darno was great last year. Can he keep that up? Can Ozuna keep up his great pace? So that's in the lineup. I think our lineup's good. I'm not sure that'll be the problem for them. In the rotation, a lot of young guys. Soroka's coming off a big injury. Uh, Max Reed came off a great, great season. I love repeating my words. I'm like, top, top, great, great. Um, best, best. Um, great, great season um, for Max Reed. Um, can he keep that up, though? Ian Anderson, we saw great, great, great. <laughs> Uh, success in the postseason. Uh, they bring in Charlie Morton, which is a move I really like. I'm not so sold on Drew Sm Smiley in the five stop. But, you know, can those guys keep performing? I think that's a question. Uh, the bullpen for them is a real question mark. They they really, uh, they lost Mark Lanson to San Diego. They lost a bunch of veteran guys out there. You know, they're trusting on young guys like Luke Jackson out there. They're trusting Will Smith to get a bounce back. You know, they're trusting these guys to get it done. So for me, I think in the New York Mets, in terms of question marks, their lineup is better than the Braves, in my opinion. Um, it's just so deep, the New York Mets lineup. The rotation is better. You know what you're going to get out of the Garam. Carrasco is consistent. I like Stroman. They bring in Taiwan Walker. Good move there. They got Peterson. Syndergaard will come back. I think their rotation. I prefer the Mets. I think you can make an argument for the Braves. Um, Mets bullpen. Without Lugo, it's a little scary, but um, there's definitely question marks always in the Mets bullpen. I think, you know, the most in baseball with Edwin Diaz, Dylan Bethance, Drew Smith, Miguel Castro. You name it, there's question marks all out there. 
but they got good guys and you know trustable guys they got a lot of depth on this team they, they made sure to go grab depth they got jonathan vr uh, kevin pilar they just signed jose martinez they got depth there so for me i like the new york Mets better than the braves both playoff teams for sure in my opinion and then after that um, I have Washington um, with about 83 wins. Mets, I have 93 wins. Braves, 90. Then I got the Nats with 83. I'm just not sold on that Nationals team. I think their lineup will be good, but their big additions to the lineup was Schwarber and Bell, two guys that are question marks that last year didn't hit for much average. Josh Bell was fantastic. These guys have been uh, all-stars at the peaks of their career. Josh Bell is an MVP-type candidate. But right now where they're at, it just doesn't seem like they're at that point. So can those guys recover, get to this top, top point? <laughs> I swear, bro, I can't. I keep saying top, top, great, great. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm being getting lit up on a on a broadcasting review right now. Mike Quick would be taking me to church right now. but Maybe, um, he, likes, maybe he likes the extra emphasis. Maybe. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe Brucey Boy will it is enjoy a it. But, um, yeah, I'm not sold on that lineup there. Bullpen, um, good move with Brad Hand. I like that move. Um, you know, the rotation, they've got that big three. The back end, I don't love. I don't like Lester's much anymore. The big three even has question marks. Strasburg's coming off big injuries. Scherzer's getting old. Corbin's like consistent. He's middle of the peak here. Phillies, I got 80 wins. I just don't think they're that good. They didn't really do much in my eyes. They didn't improve too much. It's kind of the same team. They just re-signed DD and Real Muto. Um, they made some additions to that bullpen, but the rotation is still a mess. A lot of holes in that lineup still. Center field's a mess. Um, you know, their outfield is just a mess outside of Harper in my eyes. And Miami, I think, will be in the last 74 win. Great season last year. But it was a 60-game sprint, like we said, and they didn't really add any pieces at all. Um, they lost more pieces, if anything. So, to me, Miami will will get worse. Um, definitely, they'll be at the bottom of that division. So, uh, just to recap for any audio listens. By the way, we have some good audio listens. If you are listening to this on audio, we really appreciate you. Um, I've been tracking the, uh, the analytics there, and uh, we've been getting some downloads, new subscriber here and there. Um, so if you haven't also go check out us on audio I'll leave links to that in the description uh subscribe to us on spotify and apple apple uh apple podcast we really appreciate that um you know yeah we're there we're there and we're we're having fun there too um but yeah uh mets at number one then braves nationals phillies and the miami Marlins. that is my nl east predictions mac what are your thoughts Guys, I'm just telling you, this is totally going to live up to everything that Griffin just said. I'm going to have the best. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I'm going to do my best here. I do have the same order of you and uh, projected standings. And I'll start off with the Mets. I have them at the top, and I have the Braves uh, just closely a little bit behind them. A lot of people could argue that the Braves uh, could be put ahead of the Mets. But right now, I think the Mets have the great offseason, and uh, the hype is there, and the hype is real. Uh, for them to become World Series contenders. They added Lindor, Pete Alonso had numbers that were down last year, but he was still a great player. Cano is now gone, so Jeff McNeil will be able to play his natural position at a uh, second base. And then also, uh, of course, the two-star players, if you know baseball or not, you know DeGrom and Syndergaard, uh, they are always the key pitchers there. DeGrom, natural, a, a really beast. And then Syndergaard, uh, you're hoping he could return to his full self after that Tommy John surgery. Uh, the team has a lot to look forward to uh, offensively and defensively, but last year uh, it was really the small things that kind of affected them, like situational hitting and bad base running. So if you could fix those little things, I think that's what will make the big difference for the Mets. And I, I saw that little smirk. Some good analysis. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I learned some stuff. Now. I mean, the, the defense was a, uh, a disaster last year, but they, they definitely made some strides. I think it'll help with McNeil at second. So I like, I mean, I'm liking your points right now. Keep going. Thank you. Let's get this on a roll. So Matt's out of them in first uh, with a 92 win season. And then the Braves in second, I have them with 89 wins. Uh, and this is a team uh, which really could fight the Mets for that first uh, or the lead and or the win for the NL East. Uh, and they've won three NL East titles straight. And they're a team that is still young and have room to get better. Uh, with uh, Charlie Morton being added to a young starting rotation, uh, they sh should be still one of the better uh, rotations in the league with Mike Soroka uh, hopefully returning successfully from his injury uh, and last year their offense it was very powerful it was second in the NL run scored uh, only behind the Dodgers and they were up three to one three to one over the Dodgers in the NLCS uh, didn't pan out but this is a team <laughs> that that will be fighting the Mets for that top spot and I have them right now sitting with 89 wins just three behind the New York Mets and now I have the Nationals I have them with an 81 win season 81 loss season as well and they still could be dangerous 
buzz that they have had that hangover from their championship uh, run. Into, well, they had their hangover this year in 2020 from that championship uh, just a few years ago. And uh, Strasburg will need to come back healthy, and Scherzer will have to improve. Will have to prove that he still could be a lead at 36 or 36 years old. So you're having question marks on this team, and you're not sure how they'll pan out. But if they do pan out, I think that'll be something that is good for the Nationals. But for the future of the team, um, you're gonna have some question marks there that you're gonna have to improve on. And Phil. And then also um, they have the good starting rotation and they added Kyle Schwarber and Josh Bell to help out Juan Soto. And uh, this team also took away Brad Hand from the New York Mets. So a lot of good pitchers, well, we a lot of good him. players. We thought we, thought we, thought we were going to Well, you, you thought. That's, technically that's what I should have said. Wasn't but uh, a, a player that you guys were looking forward to hopefully getting and adding, uh, they got him. And so this is an older team. Some things have to be proven. And I think the question marks are a little bit too big to have them as one of the better teams or a team that could put up numbers and fight against the Mets and the Braves uh, for the NL East. And then now I have the Phillies with 90, uh, not 90 wins. That would have been with the Mets. They're nowhere near the Mets level, uh, 79 wins. And uh, this team is more of an afterthought right now. After the Mets and the Braves, uh, they added a handful of new relievers, including Archie Bradley. Uh, they also brought back Romuto and Didi Gregorius and uh, Bryce Harper. A few years ago, that MVP for him, he hasn't been that since, and I think they want to have a chance uh, to be great and compete in the future. He's going to have to return to that form, which he hasn't been uh, recently. So the Phillies, I uh, have them fourth right now in the NL East. And lastly, the Marlins, uh, they are probably still a year or two away from being real contenders. Uh, I have them sitting at 72 wins this year. Last year, they actually did well. They fought and they made that expanded playoffs. They got their spot and was a real big surprise in the MLB. But um, they will be able to put up some good fights with young pitching, but they will still need some help at the back end of their bullpen. But right now, I have the Mets with 92 wins, Braves with 89, Nationals with 81, Phillies with 79, and the Marlins with 72 a good list there i like the uh the analysis for someone who doesn't know too much about baseball is uh you couldn't tell i'll tell you that so um good work good work in the prep there i gotta say um all it's all everyone it's all thanks to griffin he he, he's the real mvp and helping all this helping me with all this well you know we each have our strengths and uh you know i'd say you, you definitely for the mock draft you definitely are going to be uh just make some analysis for future drafts i mean i don't really know what i'm talking about some of these guys but um yeah that's all kind of i got for uh today's episode a uh, lot of good subjects and uh hopefully we'll be able to keep a format like this for the next uh few episodes coming down but uh yeah i don't know if you have anything else you want to talk about um real quick or if you want to wrap it up I think we're good to wrap this thing up. It was a great episode. We hit some M NFL points. We hit some MLB points. A lot of new things we're introducing to this channel now that the NFL season is over. A lot of shifts and a lot of great things to look forward to. As Griffin said throughout this, I'm going to reiterate it. You got to go follow us. You got to subscribe to us. You got to like, comment, and I'm going to say subscribe once again. Go over to our Spotify and our Apple. It's outside the arena. On those, uh, listen to our podcast there if you don't want to see the video version on YouTube. But uh, follow us on Instagram as well. Our Instagrams are Mac.Rommel. Griffin's Instagram is? Uh, Griffin Senek. And our podcast, podcast, not podcast, Instagram is outside the arena <laughs> podcast. Make sure to follow us there. And please let us know what you guys want to see. Would you like to keep seeing things like this? Are there any more funny or fun, more fun kind of segments you want to see uh, that we may be posting on OTA clips and you may want to incorporate that into this channel? Please let us know. Anything new would help. And we'd love to do that for you guys. We hope you all stay safe and enjoy your weekend. <laughs>